Good afternoon, uh, the participants who are physically present and who are virtually present. We are going to have a good discussion today. The topic is surgery for seizure freedom. Is it old wine in a new bottle? Wine is always sweet, whether it comes in old bottles or new bottles. That's what my experience. So I know that most of the people will feel that. Uh, and I'm sure Sanjay, knowing him, that I know that at the end of the lecture, it will be a sweet presentation, a sweet wine. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Fernando is consultant pediatric neurologist, Columbia North Teaching Hospital, and the National Epilepsy Center of Sri Lanka. His topic today is surgery for free seizure freedom. Is it old wine in a new bottle? This I got from his Facebook. He has written there, epilepsy surgery is a miraculous treatment modality. Join us to discuss further. Yes, please join. Thank you very much, Madam, for that um, kind introduction. I'm Dr. Sanjay Fernando, the pediatric neurologist from the Columbia North Teaching Hospital and the National Epilepsy Center of Sri Lanka. So the topic today, as she mentioned, is going to be uh, surgery for seizure freedom. Is it old wine in a new bottle? And the outline goes as, right. So we'll discuss about drug resistant epilepsy where the patients would uh, need some sort of a treatment apart from the conventional management. Management options available for drug resistant epilepsy. Is it old wine in a new bottle? Basics of epilepsy surgery and our experience. So what is a seizure? As we know, seizure is a, an, it's, it's a manifestation of excessive and hypersynchronous activity of the neurons in the brain. And a seizure should always essentially start from the brain itself. And these electrical bursts can cause involuntary changes in the body. It could be a movement or a function, a sensation, behavior, or an abnormal awareness. This is the easiest way to understand epilepsy, where we have an abnormal generator producing excess uh, current of electricity. And with the high networks, high electrical, uh, the, the cellular networks in the brain, that particular electrical activity is going to get um, traveled to some other place to produce the seizure. It's like this, like, you know, you have the generator, the electrical circuits, and it's the same when it comes to your brain. So what is epilepsy? Epilepsy is a tendency, is the tendency of a person to get recurrent, unprovoked seizures. And mind you, epilepsy is a neurological disease. It's a common neurological disease for that matter. And the mainstay of, mainstay of treatment for, anti, for epilepsy is anti-seizure medication. And the anti-seizure medication should be started with an accurate, confident diagnosis of epilepsy. And as you know, I think most of you guys are aware of this particular GINA guidelines, the stepwise approach, and anti-seizure medication would follow a similar pattern from, from, from where we are going to start uh, we are, we'll, we'll be starting from monotherapy, the step one, the second monotherapy, the step two, so on and so forth. It's a sequential stepwise regime when it comes to epilepsy. Uh, saying that, there is a cohort, around 30% of the patients with epilepsy would not respond, who would not respond to the conventional anti-epileptic regimes. And this is the cohort that we call as having drug-resistant epilepsy. And very kindly, the International League Against Epilepsy has defined, they have given a very clear diagnosis, not a diagnosis, a definition to drug-resistant epilepsy, where they call failure of adequate trials of two tolerated and appropriately chosen and appropriately used anti-epileptic schedules to achieve a sustained seizure freedom. So they have defined what an appropriately chosen anti-seizure medication is and what a sustained seizure freedom is. So why would the patient get drug-resistant epilepsy? The mechanism underlying are not completely known. They are multifactorial, and we still don't know what the exact reason or the reasons are. 
there are a lot of hypotheses. The, the target hypothesis and the transport hypothesis are the most cited theories, but I don't think that I should kind of, you know, discuss those, uh, the hypothesis in this particular forum. So what are the concerns of um, having anti uh, having drug-resistant epilepsy? Why are we worried? So we'll discuss about this chappy, this, this child, a seven-year-old boy with de who, is, who used to get daily nocturnal seizures, around 40 events per week, couple of seizures per night, who was on oxcarbazepine, clobazam, topiramate, and phenytoin, with uh, strength and difficulties, having major behavior issues, and he was not attending to school for last 15 or 18 months, the time he came to me. And this was his video EG record. So he used to get about, say, three, four seizures per night. Uh, 40 per week, violent limb movements, hypokinetic phenomena, and he was not going to school. All kind of, you know, the, the family background, the family system has uh, broken down by the time that they came to me. So this was the, the situation when uh, about, say, two years back. And uh, so just to summarize, so there are uh, adverse effect related to multiple side effects, polytherapy, cognitive problems, the child was not going to school, having a lot of social uh, comorbidities, ha was having a lot of mood, personality changes, restricted quality of life, and there is an increased risk of mortality, not only uh, the more mortality, morbidity as well, and the persistence issues. So those are the associations or the complications of drug-resistant epilepsy. So what are we going to do? Is it the end of the world? Not at all. So it is a fresh start into a new world because we have a lot of other therapeutic options available for drug-resistant epilepsy. So obviously we are going to discuss about uh, the surgical modalities today. And apart from that, they mention about lifestyle modifications, the dietary therapy, and neurostimulation. And the anti drugs, there are certain anti drugs which are of uh, kind of, I would call them new drugs, which we haven't trialed, maybe in Sri Lanka. So we can give a, a drug trial, uh, a newer version of a drug trial, but we'll be discussing about neurosurgical options today. And this is a nice study to say, or just to say why, why the, what, now exactly, this is exactly why I am here on this, uh, on, on this stage because I think that there is a major treatment gap when it comes to drug-resistant epilepsy. Probably when uh, Madam uh, Guruge was doing her internship, there had been, probably there had been a major epilepsy treatment gap. With a lot of campaigning, this maybe we don't have evidence to say, but prob scientific evidence to say rather, probably this, uh, this, uh, the, 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 drug, the treatment gap when it comes to general, general epilepsy might have come down, might have reduced, but when it comes to drug-resistant epilepsy, still there is a huge gap. So this is a study done in Japan. It's a multi-center multi study where they have collected around 200,000 patients, and out of them, as we said, 30% was having drug-resistant epilepsy. And out of that 30%, only 40% was referred uh, re to a tertiary care center for further evaluation. So there is a referral gap, gap of around 60%. And out of the 40% who've been referred, only 12% went through a surgery, went through surgeries, and only 5% went through uh, uh, vagus nerve stimulation. We'll be discussing about vagus nerve stimulation later. And there is a treatment gap of around 80%. So what a massive gap when it comes to the, the referral and when it comes to the treatment. So there are to reiterate the fact that there is a major surgical treatment gap in patients with drug-resistant epilepsy that needs to be addressed. That is, why I, that is why I am here, and I really fear that there is a major surgical treatment gap here in Sri Lanka. And what are the reasons for this, uh, the surgical uh, treatment gap? So this is, again, a literature, literature review done by 
uh, uh, new done by the the epilepsy surgery team from one of the epilepsy surgery teams from New Jersey, USA, and according to them, so there are a lot of reasons for us to get uh, for this surgical treatment gap. There is definitely a knowledge gap, uh, loss of uh, coordination of care, patient perspectives, social barriers, complexity of the preoperative workup, and the the lack of research and uh, uh, research funding and uh, the study designs. So let's go through this, uh, the knowledge gap, lack of awareness among the neurologists and the primary care physicians regarding the definition of drug-resistant epilepsy, indications for referral, for pre-surgical evaluation, availability of the surgical treatment options. So if you are going to count, so if I, unfortunately we don't have much on the, the audience, so if I'm going to ask to raise up the hands, of people who have who heard of epilepsy surgery here in Sri Lanka, it's going to be a minority. And the surgical outcome data, still we don't have our surgical outcome data here in Sri Lanka. And minimal training regarding epilepsy surgery for neurosurgeons, not only the neurosurgeons, and the neurologists as well. So if you are going to go back to the history, right, so history of epilepsy, the history of epilepsy is an associate of humanity and reports date back to antiquity. Almost all the cultures, including the Babylonians, your Egyptians, to Greeks, to Indians, even from the pre-Buddhist era, there had been, we bear some witness regarding epilepsy. This is rather interesting, I would say. I think Madam Guruge being one of the, the great uh, the Buddhist uh, followers, I, I'm sure that you have heard of this Girimananda Sutra. So it's it's uh, it was uh, preaching done by Lord Buddha to Ananda Thero because this uh, the Girimananda Thero was fallen sick. He was suffering with due to his illness, and uh, uh, Lord Buddha has uh, preached. Is it the word preaching uh, uh, sutra? I'm sure that there is a different word for that, right? So he has mentioned about all the diseases in a human body. See, it's something like international classification of disorders. If somebody is going to go through the Girimananda Sutra, you would be really fascinated because he has mentioned, Lord Buddha has mentioned about all the diseases in the human body. And he has subclassified CNS diseases, diseases brain origin disorders as uh, Shirsha Roga, Mursha Roga and Appamaha Roga. Shisha Roga again has been subclassified as uh, tumors, etc. and etc. Mursha Roga are drop attacks, uh, syncope. And Appamaha Roga is your epilepsy or apasmara. And not only in the Buddhist philosophy, in the, the, the Christian, Christianity, if you have heard of the transfiguration of the Christ on Mount Tabor, and this is a uh, picture or a painting done by Raphael. Uh, from he's an uh, Italian uh, painter. So this is from the Bible. Teach, I brought my son to you because he has an evil spirit in him uh, and cannot talk. Whenever the spirit attacks him, he throws him uh, to the ground and foams at mouth, grits his teeth and becomes stiff all over. So there in the Bible, they have very clearly described a child with a so-called, I don't want to use the word, but a grand mild seizure or a generalized tonic chronic seizure. And this is the painting done by Raphael, which is there in the Vatican Museum. And if you could see the eyes rolled up, dystonic posturing. So this is the father who, poor father who has uh, brought his uh, son for the preaching of uh, the Jesus. And let's go and discuss about uh, the surgical treatment by the beginning of surgical treatment of epilepsy again can be traced back to antiquity. The cranial trephination is a fascinating ancient practice. I don't know, I exactly don't know the way to pronounce because it's a French word to describe drilling, incision, or scraping of the skull. And the evidence of trephination can be found in from the prehistorical tombs in the Neolithic, Neolithic era, era from Piro to Egyptian mummies, Australia, North and East Africa. So this is exactly what they have done. Uh, from the skulls they have found from the, the tombs, there are multiple oval or circular scars, 
the differentials, diameters varying from one centimeter to three centimeter and occasionally going up to four centimeter. And most of those scars, or the, not the scars, the, 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 the lesions were located in the parietal and the frontal regions. Not only from the, uh, the Neolithic era, even up to now, certain North African uh, countries, they continue these factories even up to date. And the, the intent was to let the evil spirits or the gases to escape the brain, rescuing the patient or to make the patient out of, to take the patient out from that demonic spirits. And this is how they have done it in the prehistoric era. And this is the person who moved away from that, uh, that theorem on his, uh, uh, the collection on the sacred disease. He said that epilepsy is no more divine, no more divine or more sacred than other diseases, but has a natural disease and it is supposed to, uh, 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 it's supposed to be divine in origin because of the experience uh, about that particular the disease, and they wonder, and the the, the chaotic and the the abnormal uh, the movements, the the chaotic nature of the disease itself. I think we underwent a similar situation a couple of years back with COVID. We didn't know about COVID, and we didn't know what to do and what not what not to do. So we were going behind a lot of uh, kind of you know indigenous medicine, like you know the spirits, this and that, because. If you don't know about the disease, if you don't know about the, 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 the pathophysiology, we are, we are going to get a little bewildered. So in the Hippocratic corpus of, on the sacred disease, he described about the surgical management. And he said that the surgery should be performed on the contralateral side of the affected body. So he knew that the surgery should be done on the opposite side of the, the side where the patient is going to get the seizure. And this is the person, Sir Victor Alexander Horsley, whom we consider as the father of modern functional neurosurgery. He is the first person to remove an epileptogenic focus from the motor cortex under general anesthesia in a more civilized way, I would call it. So he, he used or he combined the clinical characteristic with the cortical stimulation and he proved the efficacy of epilepsy surgery during his era. Uh, going back to the previous slide, this is in 1886. And however, the mortality rates were not that good. So it, they were hovering around five to seven, relatively high, I would say, compared to the data today. So he's still, he's the first person who did a civilized epilepsy surgery. So when it comes to epilepsy surgery, so selection criteria, who would, whom should we offer uh, a surgery? There are three questions which you are supposed to answer. Is it needed? Will it work? And is it safe? So is it needed? Is the diagnosis of drug-resistant epilepsy correct? Does it affect the quality of life of the patient? And is it the epilepsy syndrome which is not going to go into a spontaneous remission? So the drug-resistant epilepsy, is it a pseudo-drug-resistant epilepsy? Is it, is it an incorrect, incorrect diagnosis which we are trying to deal with? Is it something like uh, 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 so-called pseudo-seizure, the parasomnia, a syncope that we are treating as for drug-resistant epilepsy, or is it the, the inappropriate choice of medication, inappropriate dosing, or inappropriate patient behavior, the compliance? Uh, or, uh, so going through the uh, the the confirming a diagnosis of true drug resistant epilepsy, then we should consider about the quality of life. We have enough evidence to say that intractable epilepsy or drug resistant epilepsy have a significant, significant impact on the quality of life of a child, not only on a child, even in an adult for that matter. And not only the quality of life, we have enough evidence to say that the rate of depressive symptoms are higher in, uh, higher in uh, patients with drug-resistant epilepsy versus patients with, without drug-resistant epilepsy. And unlikely to have a spontaneous remission. There are certain pediatric 
uh, epilepsy syndromes with self-limited uh, self-limited childhood epilepsy syndromes like your childhood absence epilepsy syndrome benign Rolandic epilepsy syndrome so on and so forth so we are supposed to exclude one of them before embarking upon our surgical uh, paradigm so if the answer to all three questions are yes so we are going to start the evaluation for epilepsy surgery and will it work so let's see now this is a very kind of I would say uh, very what is the word uh, a, a very good study and a very uh, uh, so she has done she has compared uh, this is from all Indian Institute of Medical Sciences done by Professor Manjuri Tripathi where she has com compared it's a randomized control trial uh, surgical surgery plus medical therapy and medical therapy alone so they have just followed up them the two groups for a period of 12 months and by the end of 12 months they found out of the cohort who underwent surgery plus medical therapy 77% uh, were seizure free whereas the cohort who were waiting without uh, getting the surgery only 7% uh, uh, was uh, uh, event free not only the seizure freedom there had been an impaired behavior improved behavior and quality of life in the cohort who underwent surgery and 15 cases unfortunately from the surgical cohort had complications so is it safe as we discuss about the complications so we should consider the complications as well so the page the the complications the general risks of a major epilepsy major surgery are applied here as well the response to anesthesia your bleeding tendencies the infections tissue brain injury and delayed healing healing of the suicide side etc and etc and there are certain other complications which are related to epilepsy surgeries per se problems with memory uh, the visual problems if you are going to deal with the visual area or the visual tracts of the, 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 the brain the patient might get uh, hemi, hemi, hemianopias double visions the mood problems the, mo the, the motor skills imp impairment in motor skills and speech difficulties saying that this is again from the International League Against Epilepsy. They say that majority of the complications after epilepsy surgery are minor or temporary, as they are, tend to resolve completely without much intervention. And major permanent neurological complications remain uncommon, very fortunately, and mortality as a result of epilepsy surgery in the modern era is, extre is extremely rare. So, just the, the previous definition and so and the, the previous previous uh, the slide regarding the epileptogenic zone the generator and the networks so there are certain surgery surgical procedures which we performed in the worldwide even in Sri Lanka we can do a resection resection of the generator so we are going to take the generator out or we are going to disconnect the generator from the rest of the brain. So the generator, insi generator is inside, it's going to produce enough and more electricity, but it's not, going, it's not being connected to the rest of the brain. Because of that, the patient is not going to, to get a seizure. And there are certain methods like VNS, which could reduce the surge seizure burden, but it's not going to be, it's unfortunately not going to be curative. So there are certain other methods like um, corpus callosotomy, which are palliative surgeries, which should reduce the seizure burden. For an instance, if the patient is going to get 100 seizures per day, the patient might get 50 seizures per day after the, 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 the procedure. Or if he's going to get very major attacks, drop attacks, the, the event severity might go down following the surgery. And this is a resection where we are going to take the generator and the excitatory networks out. And this is a disconnection. We are going, going to disconnect the generator from the rest of the brain. So the, let the generator generate, but it's not going to travel along the networks to the 
the areas, the rest of the areas of the brain. And this is the VNS, which we have implanted here in Sri Lanka for patients, for kids up to now, where we insert something like a cardiac pacemaker into the, the, the thoracic, uh, the chest, chest uh, what is it called, the subcutaneous fat on the chest wall on the left side, and where we connect uh, 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 a wire to the left-sided vagus nerve, and we stimulate the vagus nerve with a minute current continuously, and it, it, it has a kind of, you know, a very complex mechanism of action, which I'm not going to discuss today, but which would reduce the seizure burden. And this is the corpus callosotomy, the other, other, uh, other uh, what's it called, the palliative procedure, where we are going to disconnect uh, the, both the, the corpus callosotomy or resect the corpus callosotomy, disconnecting the two hemispheres, uh, the, letting the two hemispheres to function independently. Again, disconnecting or disrupting the epileptogenic networks, which we have done uh, here in Sri Lanka. And I think I should mention about the first ever epilepsy team in Sri Lanka. The, the gratitude should, should go to Professor Ranjani Gamage, who is the mastermind in uh, starting the epilepsy surgery program in Sri Lanka, along with Professor Radha Krishnan, uh, whom I consider as one of uh, our, like, you know, uh, who has uh, played a father role when it comes to epilepsy services in Sri Lanka. Still, he's in contact with us. And Professor Malla Baskar Rao from uh, uh, Nimhans, India. And the first team. Uh, from Sri Lanka, uh, Dr. Sunil Pereira, Dr. Sudat Gunasekara, General Sanjeev Munasinghe, uh, Dr. Rohini Ranbala, and Dr. Swarna Vijaytunga. I think uh, we, our, grat we should pred uh, our gratitude should go to them, and they started uh, the program from uh, scratch. And the National Epilepsy Center is the only state-of-the-art tertiary care. This is, I'm here actually to market the National Epilepsy Center. So the National Epilepsy Center is the only state-of-the-art tertiary care epilepsy management institute in Sri Lanka. Again, a mastermind of Professor Ranjani Gamge. She built this building through, uh, of, uh, from Saudi funds, not from the funds of, uh, from the local funds. She got a, uh, an overseas fund and she built the, 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 the building from the beginning. And we conduct a weekly pediatric clinic at the National Reference, and that is the na pediatric clinic, and that is the National Reference Center for Pediatric Patients for Drug-Resistant Epilepsy. And we do perform, at least we are supposed to perform, two surgeries per week on Tuesdays and Fridays, and we conduct a multidisciplinary team meeting every other week on Fridays. If you want to come and visit our center, this is the place where the epilepsy center is sited, uh, in the Kingsley Road, or uh, just uh, if you know where the PGIM building is. So it's close to the PGIM building, gate number 11. Right, and this is the building, which is a five-star building, I would say, eight-storied with all the facilities, which would keep in par with all the epilepsy centers, not only the regional centers, the places where we have worked, from Queen Square, London, to West Mid Children's uh, Australia. And the moment a child enters our clinic, the child, the, the, all the referrals, we, are, we entertain referrals to our clinic. We have a clinic, all the doctors can uh, refer. I do invite you, all of you, to refer children because we can sort out, we can see whether the patient is having a drug resistant epilepsy and or not. So please refer. If you think that the patient is having some sort of a difficult, a complex epilepsy, please refer. We do conduct a clinic. Today morning, we conducted the clinic. Thursday mornings, room number seven, National Epilepsy Center. All the patients are going to go through either by a consultant, the pediatric neurologist, or one of the senior registrars. We do exclude the pseudo drug resistant epilepsy, and the patient is going to go into their surgical treatment evaluation path if it is a true drug resistant epilepsy. And after doing the evaluation, the patient is supposed to face the multidisciplinary team meeting, which is going to happen every other week on Fridays. And there, where we are going to assess the suitability of this particular patient as 
and epilepsy surgery candidate. Right. So, so actually, the, the objective of this pre-surgical evaluation, which I described, would be to assess the epilepsy-related zones, the epileptogenic, the, from where the generator is, where the networks are. So if we know where the generator is, we can disconnect the generator, we can take the generator out. So we do a proper assessment to see where the generator is and what are the connections of this generator. Uh, so we are essentially supposed to, we are supposed to take the history, the clinical semiology, the seizure uh, phenomenology as we call it, uh, the MRI brain and, and VDVAG, where we are going to capture the seizure with the EEG recording simultaneously. And all the other investigations would depend on the, the, the patient. Depending on the patient, we are going to tailor made the rest of the investigations. We have these facilities. We have a three Tesla MRI scan that is one of the, the, the highest ranking MRIs in the world. We have a functional MRI facility. Uh, we have the PET facility that is positron emission topography. We have the SPECT facility. We have the VDVG facility. We have the intraoperative monitoring facility. We are going to monitor the patient intraoperatively during the, the surgery. We, have, we do the sur surgeries under a navigation. We'll discuss about the navigation. And we have the VNS facility, as I described. So this is the multidisciplinary team where we have the, the neurologist, not the neurologist, we'll start from the patient and the parent, the neurologist, uh, the pediatric neurologist, the, the clinical neurophysiologist, the neurosurgeon, the social service officer, so on and so forth. Right, so the, the moment patient passes the MDT, the, the child should would go into, the child would fall under this list, the waiting surgery list. And we do surgeries under the guidance of navigation with motor mapping if necessary and with ECOG. So as I said, the neuro navigation is, we are not going to operate the patient blindly. We are going to operate the patient with uh, keeping our MRI by the side. So we correlate the functional anatomy, the live anatomy, to the MRI finding. For an instance, if there is a lesion in the MRI, and if we're going to touch the, uh, the lesion uh, physically during the, the surgery, we know that we are what exactly we are going to touch, uh, and we can compare the MRI lesion with the live anatomy of the brain. And motor mapping is, uh, uh, again, another fascinating modality which we do. We insert EMG needles into certain uh, muscle groups, hand muscles, maybe leg muscles, and uh, we stimulate the brain area, and we record the, the muscle action potential during the surgery. So we can relate the motor area, the language area, the proximity of the motor and the language area to the epileptogenic zone, and we can salvage those areas. So the patient is going to get a minimal, what's it called, a damage, loss to his eloquent cortex or the motor cortex, the language cortex, while we are taking the, the bad zone of the brain out. Not only that, so this is what exactly we do regarding the electrocorticography. Electrocorticography is an EEG which we are do, going to do after opening the skull. So this is a picture, we have opened the skull and the dura mater, the surface of the brain is open, exposed. So we do an EEG, so this is an EEG strip. So we are going to record the EEG and we are going to see from where exactly the seizure is going to start, from where exactly the generator is going to have the highest electricity, producing the highest electricity. So we are going to chop that particular part out from the brain and we are going to do redo the same thing. And we know that we are, we've got rid of that electricity to a certain extent. So we, we target at least 80% uh, of uh, the, the reduction of the electrical burden then and there. So we know that for sure that the patient is going to be event free or less events compared to the number of events the patient has had before uh, going through the surgery. And the patient has 
good motor and language functions. So this is uh, since uh, this is uh, our experiences from our clinic. From this is um, with all the calamities going, your uh, the COVID restrictions and your regular restrictions, the fuel crisis. So from uh, August 2020 to uh, uh, December 2022, we've come across all, almost 200 patients with drug-resistant epilepsy, referred patients with drug-resistant ep epilepsy. 22 had pseudo-drug-resistant pseudo epilepsy, whereas 172 had, uh, 177 had true drug-resistant epilepsy. Unfortunately, 18 lost the follow to follow up. Pre-surgical evaluation was done in 90 patients. Epilepsy surgery meeting was done in 43 patients. 47 were waiting the epilepsy surgery meeting, and we are going through the epilepsy surgery evaluation in 69 patients at the moment. We did 24 surgeries so far, uh, nine were waiting surgeries, two patients refused surgery after the meeting, and so this is, the, this is exactly what we have done so far in our clinic. So 24 children have undergone epilepsy surgery, as I mentioned, with more than, uh, 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 22 with more than six months follow-up. And so this is the, the distribution of uh, the generators, the, the, the pathologies of the brain. Some of them had uh, temporal sclerosis to, if you have heard of Rasmussen's encephalitis, to scar tissues, to tumors, long-term epilepsy-associated tumors, to cortical malformations of the, the brain. And this is what we have done. We have taken out the temporal lobectomies. We have taken out uh, the whole hemisphere out in about say, three patients and occipital lobe out, occipital resections, lobectomies, to our tailored frontal resections. And this is what we've done uh, when it comes to the epilepsy. So if you are going to, if you were to discuss the outcome data, so this is the standard or the international way of discussing the outcome data when it comes to epilepsy surgery, which is called the Engel out Surgical Outcome Scale, where class one is seizure freedom, no disabling seizures, class two, rare disabling seizures, class three, worthwhile, disabling, worthwhile improvement, and class four, no worthwhile improvement. So in our cohort, we have the majority would fall under class one. Class two and class three fail. Actually, class three, this is the, the cohort whom we have done the, the vagus nerve stimulation, and class four, nobody, very fortunately. And when it comes to the complication rates, we are fine at the moment, touch wood. No major complications so far. And this is the quality of life, pre and post surgery, uh, epilepsy surgery. There is a significant improvement in the quality of life at six months post-surgery. And so regarding our child, the child whom we have discussed uh, to begin with, a seven-year-old boy who had daily nocturnal seizures, 40 per week, who was on oxcarbazepine, clobazam, topiramate. This is the first child whom I met. This is the first uh, registered patient in my clinic. That is why I discuss about this child wherever I go. And uh, this child is off medication. This is the MRI of this child. If you could see, it's a very small lesion. It's a very small cortical malform malformation, which we call a focal cortical dysplasia, which we have taken out. And this child is event free, off anti-seizure medication, going to school. And he, went, he, go, he just passed his scholarship exam, going to a so-called uh, uh, a, a big school or kind of, you know, a reputed a sc school with a, a big name at the moment, and he's doing fine and good. And just to summarize, drug resistant epilepsy is not the end of the world. So it's, I, I, I beg you, and I just ask you, and I suggest you to refer patients early to minimize the surgical treatment gap. And identifying the epileptogenic zone is the key while salvaging the aliquant cortex of the brain. The, we have the National Epilepsy Center with almost all the facilities. And so our outcome rates are good. And there is a pediatric clinic on every Thursday, 8 a.m., room number 7. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Sanjay. That's I learned a lot on epilepsy on surgery because it's the first time I have listened to a lecture on this subject. Uh, now, what are the now? This is done in adults also. That's epilepsy surgery. Uh, what do you feel as resistance in people in sending refer, referring patients for surgery? Yeah. So, so as I discuss, so it's it's multifactorial once again, madam, because. Majority still don't know about the options av available for so-called drug-resistant epilepsy. And we don't know the definition of drug-resistant epilepsy. And, uh, and uh, so this is it. So I think I just uh, showed this slide, yeah. lack of awareness. Uh, the, we don't know the exact definition, the indications to refer, uh, the pre-surgical, we don't know about the pre-surgical evaluation. We don't know about the outcome data. We don't know about the available facilities. So I think that is exactly why I am here discussing about uh, the epilepsy surgery and the other modalities available for pa patients with drug-resistant epilepsy. Are there any other questions? Maybe not. That these patients who have been surgery had been done, are they still on anti-epileptics? Yes, they are supposed to be on antiepileptic drugs for a period of time. So if they if they are if they are really event free, so there is a way of tapering the medication over a period of time. Again, it is tailor made. It depends on the lesion. It depends on the the post surgical MRI findings, the post surgical maybe the EG findings, and maybe the number of seizures that he has got after uh, after going through the uh, the surgery. So it's multifactorial, but. The majority, I'm sure that we can get rid of anti seizure medication. Can I ask a verbal question? Yes, can please. you hear? Uh, this is Arjun Aduhare. I'm curious to know what is the incidence of motor or sensory deficit in the patients post surgery? Can, can you repeat your question, please, sir? What is the incidence? of motor or sensory defects in the patient yes. after the operation? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for that question, sir. That depends on the, the place that we are going to operate. For an instance, if you are going to touch the motor strip, or if you are going to touch the sensory strip, strip, strip the patient might end up having motor or a sensory deficit, saying that so we have a lot of, uh, lot of, uh, lot of uh, we have techniques to to salvage the motor strip and the sensory strip, as I said, so we are going to do a motor stimulation while doing the surgery, and we are going to find out where exactly the hand functions are going to uh, uh, get represented in the brain. And we are going to see where the sensory functions are there. So we are not going to touch that area. We are going to leave that area, and we are going to resect the rest, and uh, so that's it. So the incidence, I would say, very, very rare unless that the patient is going to get an unfortunate incident like a vascular damage or an infection, post-surgical infection, or something like that. Did I answer your question, sir? Yes, but what is not clear is that what happens if they supposing they have an epilepsy in which they get lower limb convulsions or right-sided convulsions, when you tackle that area, don't you tackle the motor supply to that part of the body? Don't yes. You yes. So saying that, as I said, if it is in the motor cortex, so that depends. Let's say, for instance, if the patient is having a significant seizure burden, and if the if the seizure, as you said, if the generator is on the the leg area, and the patient is having 150 seizures per day, the patient might fancy getting rid of seizures, salvaging some limb functions to a certain degree, because especially in children, sooner the better. So we, we can get rid of that particular part of the brain, and the, the, the opposite side of the brain would take over the functions of the limb functions, uh, the, the hand functions. So that is why we say, and that is why we ask to refer patients as early as possible. And as you mentioned about the leg functions, a seizure with uh, the limb involvement, so the, the patient need not essentially have the generator on the, the, the motor strip. The patient might be having 
the, the generator somewhere else, but the network is going to stimulate the motor area and the patient is going to get a limb seizure. So we are going to find out where exactly the generator is. It's not, it might not be on the, the motor strip. It could be in the occipital loop. So we are going to get disconnect or we are going to get rid of the generator without touching the motor strip. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do you have any questions? Maybe not, not maybe not because we are Hello. getting a bit of tough teaching with you. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes, 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 please, yeah. Um, I'll, try, I'll try and um, open my camera, I mean, on the back of the car, actually. Um, yeah, um, I'm Durga Herat. Um, I'm so nice to see Madam Gurke and Sanjay both. Madam Gurke was my first consultant, and Sanjay was my first pediatric colleague. Um, and uh, really nice and proud to see that uh, the, the National Epilepsy Center and uh, the journey um, the, the Sri Lanka has uh, so far the, the achievements of, of that center um, in epilepsy surgery. Um, I am a, a pediatric epilepsy consultant in the UK, and I thought I'd um, share a, a couple of experiences in terms of Madam Burke was asking what is the um, the reference, like the reference gap. I think. Uh, probably a good guideline might close that gap. Um, and um, like the, if you share the, the UK experience, the NICE guideline it clearly um, advises everyone to refer um, anyone with uh, a clear focal motor seizures or a, a clear um, focal um, brain um, like abnormality on the imaging and children under two years with focal seizures to an epilepsy specialist. And that way, um, without delaying the assessment, children can be safely referred to the surgical evaluation. That's probably one easy fix for um, uh, the referral gaps. Um, and I, I also, I thought um, I will make a little bit of a comment about uh, the um, complications. Yeah, uh, if the epileptogenic uh, is in the motor area, of, um, the speech area, you can have a, a dense hemorrhage or a, a speech deficit following uh, the surgery. And um, do, Sanjay, do you do um, neurocognitive assessments as, as part of um, the yes. evaluation? Yes, definitely. That is why uh, yeah. Dr. Swarnavijit yeah. uh, was in the, the, the team, and then they, we have a couple of yeah. uh, new uh, neuropsychologists and neuropsychiatrists. Uh, in our team at the moment. Yeah, you are absolutely right in saying some patients do choose to have a hemiplegia rather than 150 seizures a day. Um, yeah, and uh, as long as the families correctly understand that this might be the outcome, yes, um, yeah, complications can be there and some people still choose to have the complication rather than um, resistant epilepsy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, Durga. Hello. Hi, thanks. Hello, thanks, Madam. Durga. Thank you. Thank you, Durga, for the, com for the comments. And thank you for mentioning my name. <laughs> I haven't forgotten you, Madam. <laughs> yeah. you, you sound very different now. With the great accent. Oh, that's because I'm in the back of a car, Madam, not because I have changed. Okay, okay. Thank you. 